Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. This is your host, Michael Weaver, and we are so lucky. We have a special guest today, Mr. Jorge. Jorge, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. Doing great. How about yourself? Love I'm good, my man. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Absolutely. It's uh, anytime. I'm just enjoying some coffee and, and, and learning a bunch of um, on what you got going on here. Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to get buzzed on the buzz today, my man. So, <laughs> um, first of all, I like to always start this off with, so who was Jorge before insurance? Um, wow. So, uh, so I'm, I'm originally from, from Florida, but ever since graduating college, I've always been in the insurance industry. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of what I'm passionate about. Um, I started in the corporate world, uh, right, right out of college, uh, for, for my current company. And, uh, like I said, just, just kind of worked myself through the ladders and got to work in different departments and get different perspectives. And as I worked in each department, I just continued to grow an appreciation for the industry and what was possible. Uh, within it. So it's, uh, it's exciting. So you were on the corporate side for what, eight years? Yep. Yep. Okay. So what made you, what first intrigued you about maybe leaving the corporate side and, uh, and becoming an agency owner? Uh, so my last role on the corporate side was, uh, it goes by different names, but field sales leaders or market leaders or territory manager or whatever you want to call it, where you work directly with agency owners and helping support them in reaching their goals. And uh, I worked with a lot of great agents. I was in the state of Indiana at the time. And um, it, again, it's just growing an appreciation for what they go through, what they do on a day-to-day and running an operation. And I just felt like I can do it. Um, and for, for me and my family and the team that I built. Uh, so I would take the leap of faith. Uh, it's a huge risk, but um, it's been, a, it's been an exciting journey so far. No, I, I, I imagine it sounds like you've, you've knocked it out of the park the last, last two, two and a half years. So congratulations. So what do you think you learned maybe on the corporate side? Because you were corporate, then you started working with agents and obviously you became an agency owner. So lots of history, lots of background, lots of knowledge, what do you think maybe is one thing you learned on the corporate side or working with agents that has helped you get off to such an amazing start as a, as a young agency owner two years in? Yeah, the, the biggest thing that I always tell people is that, um, hold on one second, I'm sorry. Awesome. I'm sorry, I got a distraction. You're just good. Popped up. Um, so no, the biggest thing that I tell people all the time is that I don't know all the answers. Like I tell people straight up, I do not know all the answers, but if there is a question or something I don't know, I know exactly where to go looking for it. And sometimes that's, that's even more important than, than knowing everything um, or thinking, you know, everything is just knowing where to go to go ahead and help you solve those problems. And so I can kind of connect the dots from an organizational structure on what's going on um, and how to get things done. Yeah, absolutely. Asking for, um, and then it's funny you mentioned that because asking for help, I think is one thing that a lot of people really struggle with, whether it's, they don't want to look dumb or maybe they, they want to look like they have all the answers. So I, I love that answer. Like the willingness to ask for help. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't, can't sit here and say you have all the answers. And I, I mean, the crazy thing, and we were talking about it earlier is that uh, the insurance industry is, is so massive and it's so ch- it's changing so quickly and it's always been changing quickly. So you always have to stay on your toes. And I learn something new every single day. Um, it's that's what makes it so exciting. That is one thing I absolutely loved about being an agency owner is <clears throat> there's all like I felt like you can you never know everything because the industry either is always changing or new products or new rules. And so I love that. Yeah, it's always keep, always keeps you on your toes. You're never going to know everything in the industry. Yep, yep. So, two years in, what do you think has been your if? So, if you look back, um, year one, what's one thing that maybe you struggled with that today you're like, man, if I could do that differently, I would go back and change that. Um, something that I struggled with that I would change right away. Um, I go back to kind of the individual that connected us, which is uh, Gary on the recruiting side. Uh, the biggest thing is people, um, is making sure you got the right people in the right seats and that they're performing and you're holding them accountable. And when I first started, I think maybe I 
maybe recruited a little bit slowly and I spent maybe too much time with the wrong people. And I probably would have um, done that, maybe recruited at a larger scale, been more confident in that and hire quickly and fire quick as well. Um, you know, it's, this isn't for everybody. And I, now I have that transparent conversation with each person that I'm interviewing, like, Hey, we, we have a lot of people, we have 10 sales agents on the team now. Um, we've had, you know, more than that, obviously, and it's not for everybody, but for the people that this works out for, they're going to do very well for themselves and their families. Um, so yeah, just hire quick and fire quick. Man, that's, um, <clears throat> that's, I love that answer. Cause I think as a small business owner, especially a, a new agency owner, sometimes you just try to keep people in the seats, regardless if they're working out or not just to have like a butt in a chair. And, um, that was one thing that I can definitely relate to as well is yeah, at least you have someone in the chair, but if it's not the right person, what does that do to your culture? hundred percent. I was going to make that comment too. If you're going to bring culture is so important. And, and sometimes you feel like hostage to these people because to your point, like even if they're producing a little bit, it's like, I don't want to let that person go because what's going to happen? How do I replace that production? Um, but it's, it's, it's almost like a cancer at some point. Absolutely. And, and I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but I felt like when you get rid of when you get rid of somebody that's not necessarily the best fit, okay, whether the job's not for them, maybe the culture's not for them, whatever it may be, that change I always saw as like positive in the office. I felt like when you got when you get rid of someone that's no longer supposed to be there, all of a sudden, like the it's like an energy shift in the office. The mm -hmm. production typically increases, whether other people start stepping up. Can you relate to that at all? Yeah, hundred percent, and it, it has never failed where. I have gotten rid of somebody and production has actually gone up. <laughs> um, let's say that person just wasn't, wasn't good and didn't trust the process and didn't do what maybe what you were coaching them to do and, and right work in the system that you have in place at your specific agency. Um, but those other people that are there that are living into that, they take that workload now and are able to maximize each of the opportunities where that individual beforehand wasn't. So they just, you get a better ROI too. That's right. Less, uh, less people to manage more production. Mm -hmm. That's a win-win for everybody. Yep. So, yep. Um, and it's a win-win for the team because they're making more money too. Like it's uh exactly. So for anyone out there listening to this, if you've got someone that's just stopped working out, pull the trigger, quit hesitating yeah. and pull the trigger. So, all right, man, that's good. Dropping golden nuggets. This is, this is, we're, we getting buzzed on the buzz already. This is really good. All right. So love it. What, so I asked you your biggest struggle. Um, now let's flip the coin. What do you think you've done really well in the two years that has helped you be as successful as you have been besides obviously asking for help, going and finding answers like you touched base on what's maybe a process that you're like, man, if I could share something with a, with a new agency owner or an agency owner that's struggling, this is what I'd recommend. Um, spending money. I mean, listen, in the insurance industry, especially as an agency, well, even if you take it to the, to, to the corporate level, you see how much these giant companies are spending on advertising. The insurance, insurance industry has surpassed the, the alcohol industry, right? It used to be all beer commercials that you see. Now all you see is insurance commercials. So you have to spend money um, to market to a certain extent. I know there's a lot of niche agents and, and it works out very well for them um, and have a lot of referral partners. And, and I love that. And I have referral partners too. Um, but my bread and butter is um, on the marketing side, right? Generating uh, calls and being able to speak to prospects and help people. Um, so I, I think that's something that, that has helped me for sure. I have just knowing what the opportunity looked like, I was confident in spending that money and how to use that money wisely. Uh, and one of the companies that um, we've leveraged really from about six months into the industry uh, was Teledudes. We were talking about it earlier, uh, where they really helped us um, kind of meet our goals and surpass it and really exceed anything that I thought was, was possible in my first two, two and a half years. So uh, we're, I always tell my team, we're just getting started. Now, for someone out there that's listening to this that doesn't know what Teledudes is, because I don't know what Teledudes is, what what is Teledudes? How how has how has it helped you in, in your agency ownership? 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a turnkey telemarketing company, and they really help your agency generate business. You, you provide them um, data to call on, and you don't have to worry about uh, recruiting and hiring and training and managing and worrying about payroll or anything like that. Um, these folks, the, the company does all that for you. So if you say, hey, I need two, I need three, I need four uh, marketers to help me generate business within a week. Uh, you have fully trained telemarketers helping your, your business scale because um, that's one of the biggest things. So um, for producers, right? A lot of agents will, will say, hey, I'm, I'm buying you leads, right? So call these leads. They might call them once. They might call them two times. And then after that, they say, give me more leads, right? Where if you have a company that's calling on your information for you, they're going to call nonstop until you tell them to stop kind of thing, right? It's all based off what your cadence is. Um, and that's, these leads need a lot of touch points. And our producers, unfortunately, are never going to get the same amount of touch points that an outsourced company will. Okay. Now, I love that because um, you're kind of speaking my language. So I was a cold, when I was an agency owner, I did a lot of cold calling. I, I personally did a lot of cold calling um, for like seven years with the cold call. So you took your mindset to set your team up for success. So I love this is, Instead of making maybe your team make the cold calls, and, let, and let's, let's face it, everyone listening to this right now, there is no right or wrong way to do this, all right? It's just, mm -hmm. it's what best fits your culture, what you want to spend your money on. So what you said was, okay, I'm going to have my producers in here to actually basically close the deal. I'm going to outsource the cold calling or prospecting side of things to try and get warm leads handed to the producers. Is that, is that right? hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what it is. And you maximize their time. So instead of having a producer spend all this time trying to reach someone, they can spend more time to talking to qualified prospects. Okay. It's just I'll... a better use of time. Yeah, man. All right. I dig that. I dig that. So, okay. That's a, that's a great tip. Um, let me, do you have any type of like daily success habits? that you do on like a daily basis? Like, obviously there's all kinds of books out there, the 5 a.m. club, the miracle morning. So I'm, I'm a creature of habit myself. So I always like to ask other successful individuals, like, is there anything that you do on a consistent basis that you think helps really um, help you live more confidently, both personally and professionally? Yeah. I see in my head as you're asking me that my, I keep thinking it's my answer should be working out because it makes me feel so much better. But I, if I told you I consistently do that, I'd be lying to you. <laughs> so I need to get on that. And this is a reminder to myself when I rewatch this, that I need to work out more consistently. <laughs> but, uh, but the biggest thing uh, for me is I, I set up my day pretty, pretty structured. I come in early. Um, so my office officially opens at nine but I'm usually in here by like seven, right? And I literally, there's no distractions. There's nothing. There's no one that's going to bother me. And, and I see a score and go do that kind of thing. I literally come in I, and I set up my entire day. So the meetings, um, you know, what, what prospects or customers do I need to speak to today? Any reviews, things like that. Uh, coaching opportunities. I look at all my metrics in the agency. What do we need to do? I get ready for our morning team sales meeting. So I just kind of just plan everything out. Uh, as soon as I get in. And that just helps me just be successful and just make sure I don't get distracted. I have like a to-do board um, and I kind of like scratch it off, right? And that, that scratch it off is such a good feeling, right? You feel accomplished, <laughs> at least for me. No, man. I I love that you brought that up. I actually had someone the other day on a podcast. So I don't, I think that this, this is very common, like, but that old school feeling, like even with all the technology out there, Mm -hmm. I'm one of those guys that I love pen and paper. I write down my three tasks for the day. As I knock my three tasks off, I either do a check mark or cross it off, just like you're saying on the whiteboard. Like there, there is something to do psychologically with crossing it off and that feeling it gives you a feeling productive and like, man, I'm, I'm doing something today. 100%. Yeah. I, I, I have like five different calendars. It's super annoying. I don't know how to sync them all up. <laughs> so I, I definitely keep like a, a planner and like my, my, like you said, the big buckets, like, what do I need to get done today that if nothing else gets done, these three things are going to get done. Okay. No, I, uh, I dig that, man. That's good. And yeah, working out that, uh, <laughs> that always makes us feel better. So it's, uh, I think that's the hardest thing about habits is staying. It's, it's like anything with life staying consistent, mm -hmm. staying disciplined with it. Like we know we're supposed to be doing it. 
but we let other things creep up. And so I love that you brought that up. You're like, look, I feel better when I do it, but I'm not always consistent with it. So, yeah, no, that's good. So tell me a little bit about, um, so you're two and a half years in, all right, this is great. So you're, uh, you're getting, you're finally getting settled in. Um, how big, how big is your team? Uh, we, ha- we just grew to, we got 10 sales agents and two service. Okay. You're okay. This is a really good sized team then. So tell me, tell me a little bit about, so is, from a management standpoint, what are some things you have in place to manage 12 people? Cause a lot of the agency owners out there listening to this, um, typical office is three to five people. Okay. Including the mm-hmm. agent. And I think sometimes, uh, agents are fearful of, man, what does that scaling process look like? And then what's the management side of things look like? So can, let's maybe talk a little bit about that. Cause you've scaled fairly quickly compared to, compared to some agency owners out there listening to this. Yeah, for sure. And, and you can't do it all. And you need to be very uh, cognizant of your time because it's so easy to get sucked in and work in the business instead of on the business kind of thing. So as soon as we got to five sales reps, um, uh, I promoted my, my day one sales rep. She's awesome. Courtney, she became kind of the sales manager um, so that she helps me with the recruiting and the training and development and, and the sits and, and going through kind of like the, the checklist and holding the team members accountable to our specific processes. Cause I, I would not have time to do that. Right. Um, so she, she does that. She manages that. Um, of course I still pitch in and, and, and provide value there, but, but for the most part, that's what she's accountable for. And now that we're at 10, um, we have two essentially sales managers or team leads um, so that they're not overwhelmed because my sales manager team leads also produce. Okay. Okay. Are they in charge of every line of production or are they in char- Are they almost like an agent in agent's office where they're doing financial services or what does that look like? So, uh, so we focus mainly on the PNC side. We do have a financial representative that we're partnered with for the agency. So that's more of like a referral based appointment based thing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, they're just producing the, the PNC side and everything that comes with it. Okay. And are they the ones that are having like the team meetings, the one-on-ones, all that good stuff? Yep. Uh, I have, so they have one-on-one sits with them once a month. And I also have, I have one-on-one sits with um, each team member, uh, usually within the first two weeks of each month to kind of review the prior month, just so that I can kind of touch base and keep a, a nice pulse on the agency as well. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So it sounds like you've really taken that CEO type of role to where you're more of the team lead manager, marketing, how can we set the agency up for success long term? Is that fair? hundred percent. I, even when I'm interviewing people, I tell them, look, my, I see my role as two things. It's number one, to make sure that uh, the phone is ringing and you can maximize your opportunity and two development, right? I'm going to help. I'm going to put everything in place for you to be successful. It's up to you whether or not you're going to want to take advantage of that or not. Okay. Okay. That's really good. Um, as, as two and a half years in. So, cause, so I get, the money because the money always has to be right all right Mm -hmm. so because i think that's one thing that also will hold some people back is man how do how can i actually justify bringing on maybe two more producers like is the money gonna work out or or am i gonna go in the hole or am i gonna go in debt talk to us a little bit about how you did decide to um scale that quickly with with making sure the money was right yeah, and we were, it's funny because it's similar to, to real estate. We were talking before we started the, the official call, we were talking about, well, it depends what your goals are, right? Are, are you looking to, to make a good margin right off the bed? Are you looking to just grow on the appreciation? Um, for, for me, I'm okay with maybe losing a little bit or breaking even in the first year on that producer and that marketing plan, right? It's what happens after that, right? We know that um, the beautiful thing about our industry is that renewal, renewals are going to start to kick in. And not only that, I'm growing my asset, right? Um, so the value of my book is going to continue to grow as I add more people, as I make more sales. So that's that's the way I look at, look at it. Well, and I think you just touched on something that um, is really, really good that I want to really pinpoint here. As you said, basically the comp plan, if you could, you're probably going to break even on them, maybe the first year lose a little bit of money. And mm-hmm. so I, I think that that is for anyone out there listening to this is 
I, I think that's the biggest thing to take away is make sure your comp plans are structured correctly to where it's a win-win both for the individual and the agency. Because that was one thing I always made sure as well is I might lose money on maybe the first six months. But then when I hit that renewal, boom, I hit my money back. So in the first year I'm breaking even. And then obviously with bonuses and all that stuff, I'm, I'm making money. So if you have the right producer with the right comp plan, yeah, it may cost a little bit up front, but for the most part, you should be breaking even or making money after that first 12 months. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and obviously there, there's a lot of different um, agents that are different, part of different companies or groups, clusters, whatever that, that case might be. And I know some of the captive carriers, they, they, they pay bonus. So you're, you're going to make your money on the growth side and in the IA channel, well, your renewals are huge. So you're going to make it back on the renewals. So it's just, again, making a comp plan that works for you and your producers. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And um, that's really, really good. Okay. So, cause I was, I actually was like a small, but mighty type of agency owner with the captive agency I was with. I always wanted to uh, make cash flow a lot from, from day one, start making my money work for me. So I love having these conversations cause it's, it's a different perspective. Um, and you've got that long-term 30 year mm-hmm. mindset. And I, I love that. <clears throat> um, so talk to us a little bit about just, uh, so, so you're managing 10 people, um, you're two and a half years into the business. What does your, like, what does your daily, weekly schedule look like? Daily, weekly schedule. So daily, the most important thing is we, we have, uh, I have two huddles. So I have, um, I didn't mention this. I, we have a virtual team as well. So we have a morning huddle with all the people, uh, in house at nine, uh, 30, uh, I'm sorry, nine. So from nine to nine thirty, we have a daily huddle, and then from ten to ten thirty, we have it with our virtual team because they they start at a different time. So uh, so each team lead has their own personalized huddle, and I attend both. Uh, and the biggest thing is for me is looking at the numbers, right? So um, each at the end of each day, each producer inputs their production goals, and we look at four things. We look at um, items sold. We look at talk time. Uh, we look at quoted households. How many unique individuals did you uh, were qualified quotes on that day, and the number of dials. And we're looking to hit at least three out of four metrics each day. And we know that if you're consistently hitting those numbers and getting three out of four, you're going to be successful. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we look at. And then it's just the marketing piece, looking at the numbers and kind of taking care of some fires that might pop up and renewals and things like that. Some big, big ticket clients, things like that. What's your favorite thing about daily huddles? Daily huddles is the, um, the collaboration. So to an agency that, um, might introduce this as, as something new, it might be like a culture shock kind of thing. But from day one, anybody that joins a team, it's like you're, you're thrown into the fire. We listen to one, everyone's numbers are super transparent, right? Everyone sees what everyone's doing. Uh, and then we're also listening to each other's calls and providing feedback to each other. So it's not like it's just me or the team lead saying, you know, hey, Johnny, you know, do this, this and that. It's like, hey, Katie, what do you think about what Johnny said? You know, and then everyone's helping each other. So it's a very collaborative atmosphere and, and very competitive as well. Yep. You're, uh, you're speaking my language, brother. Like daily huddles is something I preach because of the, what you just said, constant communication, mm-hmm. constantly talking about what's important, what's going to be accomplished. And then that accountability factor, every single day you're talking about where are you at, where, what are the numbers look like? And so it's that team accountability without being a micromanager. And so I love that you touch base on those huddles because I think that's a game changer for most agents and an easy way to keep your finger on the pulse of the agency along with being able to hold everyone accountable and build that team camaraderie and and like how can we win as a team? Yeah, so I I coach, um, I'm starting to, the biggest thing is like how do you replicate yourself, right? So like for me is like I'm trying to really develop uh, my leaders in a way that that I can continue kind of take one step back kind of thing and um, for them I always tell them like guys just because you're leading this this portion right it doesn't mean you have to do everything it's I try to preach on them on facilitative leadership 
right? So you can do it in a way where you can ask questions and still have them get to where where you were trying to get them in the first place. Um, so just coaching people up because it's not something that's always natural, right? You think I'm in charge of this huddle where I got to do all the talking kind of seem like you have doing the podcast right it's your podcast but you're asking me a bunch of questions and i'm answering them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like cells the more questions you ask you're empowering what you're talking about you're empowering your team to mm-hmm. lead each other to find the answers and, and i think a lot of um business owners just not agency owners it goes back to that point you made in the very beginning we feel like we have to have all the answers or we have to spoon feed. That's not the case. Your team is super intelligent. Your team knows how to be successful. You just have to facilitate or create an environment to where they're okay coming up with those answers. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. I was telling them we're not building airplanes guys. If, if we, if we just make a decision, if, if, if we break something, no one's going to die. We'll be able to fix it. <laughs> yep. I, uh, Man, you're full of gold nuggets, Jorge. This is this is good stuff right here. This is this is really really good. Just practical information that any agency owner can benefit from. So thank you. So if someone if someone wanted to contact you, what's the best way for them to to get in touch with you, my man? Um, hit me up. Uh, my email is just jcprimeinsurance at gmail.com. So jcprimeinsurance at gmail.com. Um, yeah, or hit me up on Facebook. Absolutely. Me up. So, and guys, all this information will obviously be in the show notes for sure. If you guys like this, this episode, this podcast, make sure you give us a five-star review. Tell us about it. Um, Jorge, thank you so much again for your time. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, man, this was awesome. I appreciate it. It's a good experience. And for all of those out there listening, as you know, um, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. I appreciate you all spending just a few minutes with us today. Now, go out, make it great. Jorge, thank you again, my man. Take care.